we were mentioning before, Sandra and I began this research project a few years ago, and it's part of her activist Aotearoa project, which is funded by Marsden. Um, so, so of interest for us in undertaking this particular piece of research was the manner in which the sort of claims making of redistributive movements has changed in recent history. So new, social movements in New Zealand and other English-speaking nations operate within the context of a capitalist economy, yet as argued by Jeff Goodwin and Gabriel Hetland, there's been a strange disappearance of capitalism from social movement studies in the past two decades. There's been a movement instead towards considerations of short-term shifts in cultural framing, social networks, and especially um, sort of discussions around political opportunities. And there's really an examination of the deeper causes which are lying in behind these kind of shifts. And so this change of focus is often attributed to, to scholars on social movements to the rise of new social movements, which are considered to be largely directed towards identity and towards post-material issues. So in undertaking this research, we were interested in the ways in which changes in the study of movements chimed with the claims making of the narratives of movements themselves. So to explore this, we looked at the publications of redistributive social movement organisations. And these are organisations which are concerned with the redistribution of material wealth and of, the social, and, the, and of associated opportunities in the interest of equality. And the time frame for our study is from 1968 through to the mid-2000s. So before we start unpacking any of this um, work in detail, I'll just quickly note some of the main points that emerged from our analysis. So we found that there was an incorporation of new social movement claims by redistributive movements. Identity-based claims, however, did not eclipse those which were based upon class. While class persisted, there was a move from structural forms of argumentation toward an individualization of claims making in these movements. We argue that an understanding of these changes benefits from an examination of the changing manifestations of capital and its relations to the state. That is, it is important to consider the changing nature of redistributive social movement claims making against the transition from Keynesianism to neoliberalism. So I'm now going to take a little bit of time just to tease out some of the issues that we had um, with social movement theory and the way that it sort of responded to um, movements over the last few years. And um, so as we're talking about new social movements here, these are movements which we kind of considered to have emerged in the late 1960s, and it sort of emerged around issues around gender relations, ecology and sexuality and so on. So pioneering scholars in this area of new social movements, Elaine Terrain being a prominent example, were struck by what they saw as a major rupture between movements which were traditionally associated with the left or with the working class and those which exploded on the scene in 1968. So this new wave of protest signalled for Terrain that the important issues were now, to quote him, social, political and cultural rather than exclusively economic. And those who have followed on from Terrain have placed increasingly more emphasis upon the cultural terrain of the struggle, with identity being the kind of um, principal axis of contestation. So the emergence of new social movements signalled for these theorists a turn from the economy as the principal determining factor driving um, <clears throat> social movement activity and of classes denoting the subject of struggle. Although if any of you have seen the movie Pride recently, you'll know that it wasn't so cut and dried for the movements themselves as it was for the people who have been studying them. So <clears throat> the state is also another analytical component which has tended to fall to the wayside of social movement studies over the last couple of decades. And this trend, I think, can be tied to the increased academic attention given to globalisation from around the mid-1980s. And it's sort of also been fueled by this notion that we're now in a phase of post-industrial capitalism or information society or complex society or network society or whatever, these ways that people have tried to reconceptualise um, social organisation since the 1960s. But what is clear for us is that there has been a rapid expansion of the financial sector as a means of overcoming the economic crisis of the 1970s, and this, and this financialisation of the economy needs to be seen as a key element of the neoliberal project. This project being one that has sought to deregulate the economy, increase the role of markets in public life, and to descale the welfare state at the same time. Thus, 
The state is typically considered to have a diminished role within the current era because it has to pander to dictate the global capital flows or the edicts of institutions like the IMF. Although we would think it should be more than clear following the economic crisis of 2008 that the state and our taxpayer dollars have been very important in keeping capitalism afloat. We think, this, we think that the state still needs to be right at the forefront of our thinking about the context of the movement. <coughs> I think it's important to note as well that we think the academic turn toward discussions of globalisation and the downplaying of the nation state needs to be sort of seen as concomitant with the global, with the political entrenchment of neoliberalism through the 1980s and the 1990s. So following the work of such figures as um, Leo Panitz, Stan Gindin and David Harvey, we would argue that state power has not diminished in the era of globalisation and neoliberalism. Rather, it has been directed towards different outcomes. Outcomes in which questions of class interest should be emphasised, not avoided. So we strongly oppose the downplaying of the state as an analytical category in the study of social movements. Despite what neoliberal discourse would ideally have us believe, the state, on a concrete level, continues to be the site in which class antagonism plays out in relation to people's lived experiences, as can be seen, for example, in laws governing employment relations, taxation, and access to core services. While on an ideological level, neoliberal theorists have advocated a minimal state, on a practical political level, the state continues to be a major player. Indeed, as Martin Konings has recently asserted, the neoliberal era should be seen as one in which institutional control has grown, affording increased flexibility for financial elites and enhancing their capacity of control and to share the dynamics of social life. So the state continues to influence public life and facilitates the conditions in which capital is able to operate. Resistance, however, plays an important role in shaping how this process unfolds over time. But if analysis of capitalism and the state fall to the wayside, both for people studying movements and for the movements themselves, then the ability of social movements to pursue coherent long-term strategies, we argue, has been diminished. Have a dramatic pause for a sip of water. <clears throat> so we contend that the analysis of class, economy and the state are important when considering the trajectory of social movements here within New Zealand. The disappearance of class and capitalism in the field of contemporary social movement studies is also something which we can see if we look at the wider terrain of academic work within New Zealand, um, with Brian Roper being a notable exception to this trend, and um, Patrick Ongley's thesis, which is available through our library, is also another good example of recent work in this area as well. We think that it is, that it is important to consider recent changes to New Zealand's economy and state if we want to understand social movements within this country. Our understanding of changes within the claims making of redistributive movements within New Zealand benefited greatly from situating these movements against the transition from Keynesianism to neoliberalism. With such factors as the rightward drift of the Labour Party after 1904 and the introduction of the Employment Contract Act in 1991, having had a massive impact on the movements which we studied. Further, it can be seen that there's been this problematic decline of a sort of working class voice within the state. There's no sort of vehicle that carries that voice through to the electorate now, I'd argue. So alongside these points, it is also important to acknowledge that New Zealand, as of other core states, has witnessed the emergence of new social movements within the time frame that we studied. And so it was against this sort of wider backdrop that we sought to situate our understanding of the claims making of redistributive social movements in recent years. So I'll, I'll now pass things over to Sandra, who'll briefly run you through our methods, and then she'll get on to the juicy stuff of what we actually found. So thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Um, so the question is, how do you evaluate how social movements react to changes in the political economy, to changes in the broader shifts of the nature of the state? Um, and we um, worked using archival analysis. So we went to the, the source itself, but not through interviews, um, because we were looking at a very long historic period, so we're looking at four decades. The project, the broader project, looks at four decades of activism from 1968 through to 2008. And relying on people's memories about what they did and why they did it is quite problematic. Um, so we wanted to look at how social movements represented themselves in their own publications. And this project just looks at two social movements. The first is the labour movement, the trade union movement, um, probably more commonly in New Zealand called the trade union movement. The second, um, you know, there's some contention now, and I keep having this discussion um, with people like Sue Bradford. We've called the anti-poverty movement. Now, 
in and of itself, it doesn't um, isn't the way that anti-poverty activists would talk about themselves. But we wanted to draw some boundaries around all of those groups who were taking action on behalf of the poor. So that included churches, it included groups um, that existed like beneficiaries advocacy groups. And what we did is we looked through archives to find kind of core publications um, and moments when there was a flourishing of publishing from those two groups of movements. So from um, groups representing the poor and groups representing workers. Um, in all, what we found between 1968 and 2008 to analyse was 47 different publications, but we actually read and analysed a total of 149 actual publications. So some publications we got multiple versions of over time. Because what we're looking for is broad shifts in the way movements talk, we didn't really need to examine everything a movement had written down, but we wanted to examine a broad change in their pattern of conversation. We used um, a method that is used a lot by process event analysis people called um, the SVO, the subject verb object analysis, but we modified it because what we wanted to know is who the publication was talking about, how they represented the constituency, the object, how they talked about their political interests, the claims making they had, so we were very interested in what claim they were making and against whom they were making that claim. So the um, sorry, sorry, the first was the subject, the last is the object. Um, who are they making the claim against? Is it the state? Is it capitalism as a whole? Is it transnational interests? Is it workers themselves? Um, so really, you know, it was a process of, well, Dylan and two other research assistants spent the time in the archives finding the publications, and then we spent our time poring over these publications, coding them, so coding 149 magazines or journals, however you want to look at them, that were published, or newspapers that were published by the union and anti-poverty movements. The first thing we did want to look for was, was the literature right? These redistributive movements changed massively because of the rise or the advent of identity politics. But they, you know, was that the major thing that shifted their trajectory? And so we looked at the inclusion of women, of Māori, of students, who were the movements talking to and about? You know, who were the subjects? And there's certainly a rise um, from 1968, and that might not surprise people, mm -hmm. the world's changed a lot since 1968. There was certainly a rise um, through the 80s, late 80s and into the 90s of the number of claims made on behalf of women or made on behalf of Māori or made on behalf of students. Um, or um, another rise which is interesting on behalf of all New Zealanders not just claims made on behalf of workers or the poor anymore these publications broadened out who they were speaking on behalf of but it didn't displace those core subjects it didn't completely override those core subjects and when we read into the stories what we were actually finding um, we felt was that um, the movements were actually trying to bring in new constituencies. So the union movement was talking about women's needs to try and bring women into the trade union movement. It was about bolstering and reforming those movements to some extent, but more bolstering the membership into those movements and saying, actually, the trade unions have a lot um, that they can offer to women, to Māori, in terms of better wages, pay, pay employment equity, issues around job access. So it's not that there's a displacement, there is a change. Um, really what we felt was more important, however, in changing, or the, the change we thought was more important, was actually the change in the way they talked about class as movements. So, you know, it's, it's much more stark than the way they talk about women or the way they talk about Māori or what happens with identity politics. What we found was that the early publications we looked at had very strong class analysis inside them. So the trade union movement and anyone advocating for the poor talked about class quite frequently. So, you know, from the people's voice, workers' power will beat the exploiters' power before we can advance to a classless society, which is the only road to job security of job in a world without war. So you know, that, that use of we want to move to a classless society is found in publications in the 60s and 70s. You know, you will find cruel exploitation from the employers right through this story and you'll find the courageous spirit of the workers. You will find government action directed against us then, now and in the future. So that idea that you had a capitalist class that is exploiting is very strong. So that was from the hotel 
hospital and restaurant related trades union in the 1970s. By the 1980s, late 1980s in particular, and into the 1990s, in the exact time frame for us, you know, which year did we stop talking about class is an important, it's this broader shift that we wanted to analyse. Class really shifts to the periphery of the publications. So while once upon a time it was unions and churches even and all sorts of groups acting for the poor as well as more Marxist or social, um, socialist organised or even anarchist organised groups talking about class, by the late 1980s, it's really only those publications coming out of what would be Marxist or communist-inspired groups that talk about class. Unions seem to drop it all together, and in fact, they kind of critique the other, the other groups and say, well, look at those quaint little publications that mention class, how out of date they are, how anachronistic they are, how, you know, how terrible is it that they're still in a bygone era. So there was this real kind of criticism of anyone who used class analysis. Um, you know, so um, it, it becomes it becomes quite difficult to to see any real analysis of, of class. It does shift out of those publications. As Dylan mentioned, the other thing we see that we thought was very stark in the publications is that the early publications mention the capitalists or capital class or capital itself or capitalism very frequently. It's a very common category to use. They often then seek the state as being the object who can make the difference in the state. They make claims against the state to change things. Um, that's the 1960s and 1970s in the publications. By the 1990s, the publications speaking for the poor and for workers um, often just focus on an individual employer, an individual work site, an individual small group of, um, of workers. There's no real discussion of capitalism. There's, you know, stories about barbecues of members that happen at a workplace or, you know, a conversation about a very small issue being raised at a site um, rather than a broader analysis of what's going on. So, you know, you, you temper that against what you get, say, in the Road Transport Worker, which is a union publication in 1968, you know, saying our union believes that every worker and his wife, time frame shows you what, what time frame we're working in, our union believes that every worker and his wife should endeavour to understand the economic and political setup. When this happens, the wages and salary earners will certainly fight for more of their rights. So there's this, even this conversation in this early publication of the role of unions in making sure that workers understood class, capitalism and the role of the state in ameliorating their condition. That's completely gone in those later publications. Um, the unions don't seem to be playing that role. Um, so for us, it, it's an interesting one that at the time when scholars are starting to stop talking about class and capitalism and the state, so too are the movements that we're studying. Um, and we did set this against the broader political economy and start to think, well, why is this happening? It's not particularly the rise of identity politics that has shunted these issues to one side. There seems to be something else going on. And so do we do layer at that kind of political economy level that the changing nature of the state in and of itself in New Zealand, the fact that governments from the late 80s, early 90s, start saying, you know, we can't do anything about the free market, we just have to let it ride, it's not our role to intervene, means that the state ceases to be the object for movements to make claims against. They, in fact, absent themselves. They say, it's not us. Um, they also, I guess, you know, in many of the, the moves that the state takes during the 1980s and 1990s, is about freeing capital. And so they're also saying, well, you can't make claims against this big, big thing called capital either because, you know, it's the only option for us. And as a result, class is irrelevant um, because it's been ruled out of court. And that's what we think we're seeing in those publications, if I summarise what we think we're seeing. We're seeing the fact that the political economy has been set up in such a way that we, basically, that those movements had no option or they found themselves in this position where they... They, they didn't have room to speak about the things were actually causing the oppression of the workers or the poor at that moment um, because of the actions of the state and capital classes. 
But I guess, as Dylan said, our, word, our perspective on it is, while it may be difficult to talk about those things, and even as scholars, we've started to de-emphasise the focus on state, capital and class, actually the conditions that were spoken about by our movements that we studied in 1968 and the 1970s still exist for most workers. You know, it is still a very class society and, in fact, of course, increasing inequalities mean that we shouldn't give up on those categories. And probably, if, if we had a direct line into all movements, would we say we'd like the movements to pick them back up again? You know, to see unions again doing analysis based on capitalism class um, and the role of the state um, seems very important as well. But our plea more directly to scholars to bring those back into the frame and say we can understand the change in the nature of social movements if we understand the nature and the change of, so, of the state, capital and class. <laughs> so that's, that's the outline of where our argument is, without too many really detailed, um, really, really detailed examples. The paper is available in New Zealand Sociology, so we thought we'd let you read through some of the examples. If anybody ha um, would like to read the original publications, I now hold copies of um, this data set for anybody else to use if they want here in Wellington. <laughs> so, so we'll leave it to you for questions or comments or thoughts. Uh, maybe we can begin from Wellington, and then maybe I can have a question, and yep. then the others. And then we'll move, we'll move around to, to Melanie and Max, who's joined us. And I think we've got someone who's just joined us, in, but we can't see, so I'm just going to ask for the person's name. Do we still have them? I think it was Zoe was sitting there with a muted camera. Is she still there? She maybe might. she's left us. Hi, sorry, I've just been hiding in the background. I'm in a shared office, so. <laughs> That's okay, fabulous. At least we know where you are. Yes, yeah. okay. So I don't know if there are any queries or thoughts or comments from... Um, I've, got a, I've got a question as well, kind of... Thought. Shall we get people to introduce themselves? Because that's... Given we're a small group, Leon, <laughs> you, can, you can introduce yourself. Hi. I'm Leon Salter. I'm a PhD student at the uh, School of Communication, Journalism and Marketing at uh, Massey, Wellington. <coughs> um, and yeah, so back, thanks for your um, presentation. That was really good. And I read your paper this morning. It was really good as well. Um, so basically what you're saying is that the class is kind of, as a signifier, is, is, is lost, it's almost become a cliche. It's lost its um, power as a mobilising signifier and also it's kind of antithesis to the capitalist state as well. <coughs> <coughs> um, is that, and you, you mentioned in the paper that the class retaining is, is still an objective category. Just wondering what exactly do you mean by objective category in that people are still working sort of uh, the production, the distribution and selling of material goods and they are therefore working class or Yeah, and so um, if you look in your references there, um, there's mention to Patrick Ongley's recent work. Oh, right. <laughs> and so he has done a very thorough breakdown of the um, New Zealand situation in the last sort of 40 years and this period of time in which we're supposedly a sort of post-industrial society or post-material. And he makes the argument that, you know, I think it's something like 50 or 60 percent of the workforce is still just in this... <laughs> very material kind of realm um, in terms of, you know, they might not be producing things, but they're still handling material goods, distributing them, um, providing kind of services at this lower kind of level as well. Um, and so I guess the argument goes is that type of work still persists and also the type of disadvantages that come from being situated that way. And what's missing, so these sort of objective coordinates of class are still there as I've always been, but what's mm. missing is this kind of like subjective dimension of class that people used to use for mm. organising. So there's a, kind of, there's a latent capacity there from, mm. from this material mm. base that isn't being sort of articulated. Yeah, but I think that there is now sort of attempts to try and bring this back into play a mm. little bit. So I think if you sort of look mm. at the, I mean, my own research at the moment is looking at the Occupy movement of 2011 mm. and trying to put that against this wider kind of framework that we've used mm. for this paper as mm. well. Mm. And you do start to see discussions of class happening within mm. that movement. Um, there have been 
surveys in the UK recently that have been looking at this, and you know, still the large majority of people would identify themselves as working class. So what's kind of interesting, I guess, for us is this kind of actual disconnect between the kind of like persisting objective conditions of class and the fact that, there is, that this concept still has a kind of foothold in people's minds in the way that they perceive themselves, but mm. it's sort of disappeared from academic discourse when I mean, they're looking at these areas, except for Marxists and a couple of other you know, sociologists and whatnot. And it's also disappeared from the discourse of mm. people who are meant to be representing these people, if it's through unions or within um, government. In the UK, there's definitely a lot of negative connotations with working mm. class now, with chads and with mm. and a lot of mm. that's to overcome mm. there. Yeah, mm. and you see people trying to come up with new categories to replace class, like the precariat or the yeah. multitude or, or things yeah. like that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I guess it is the fascination as to why unions would drop mm. class as a mm. signifier they use openly to their own members. Because the publications we looked at were intended <coughs> for their own members. They're not intended for broader distribution. They were, you know, they're the journals that you sent to other unionists and you sent to <coughs> members. Um, and, I mean, some of it may be the shift in New Zealand, which, again, is to do with the political economy of the de-unionising of um, blue-collar workers, of the working class. And the fact that the unions that predominantly are strong now are the unions that we belong to, the white-collar unions, um, where we have this real tension about calling ourselves workers um, as opposed to professionals. There's a, you know, a whole narrative around, but we're professionals, not workers. So as I said the other day, in universities we're being treated as workers with all of the tools and instruments that, that are used on all other workers now. Um, but we still don't see that as a signifier for us. So it could be a broader shift there, which we didn't analyse in this paper, but certainly in the broader project, thinking about who is unionising and how they identify themselves and then how their unions speak back to them is really important. Mm. Thanks for that. Any other thoughts from Wellington? <laughs> we can come back to Wellington as well. <laughs> so we can go to we can go to Palmerston North. We'll go we'll go close well I don't know if the others might be closer, Ozan, <laughs> but we'll go to you if you've got a question. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Um, um, I was wondering how do you define class today and when you look at the definitions or probably representations of class, what were the characteristics you looked at in terms of, for instance, have you considered the definition of precariat in terms of the changing understanding of class? That's one, one thing. And in relation to that, um, after giving a proper definition or a kind of definition of class, how can we bring back class back to practice and theory. What, what, what might be your uh, anticipations about that? I tend to hear of quite a classical kind of Marxist definition of class. I don't know if you want to yeah. step up. No, no, there. no, I was going to say, yes. Yeah. yeah. Away. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, like, for me, it still comes down to a person's position within relations of production and who owns the relations of production. I think you can modify that a little bit, as um, Eric Colin Wright has, by talking about, you know, expanding this category, you know, if we're drawing on Weber a little bit, of sort of like exploitative positions within the marketplace, is how he'd kind of put it. So you still have these classic divisions between the owners of, the, um, of you know, the materials of production and workers who have nothing but their labour to sell. But then gradated between these, you have people who have very specific skill sets or management positions which allow them to occupy what he calls a sort of exploitative position within this kind of framework. But you still have these two kind of like poles, I think, and that's generally where I still kind of situate my own thinking on these issues. I think that division is a very important one. And as far as the precariat goes, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit kind of torn around the way that this, this concept's put out there. On the one hand, I think there's a very kind of pragmatic quality to this term, the precariat. I think a lot of people can identify their own situation in relation to it. But at the same time, what Guy Standing's calling the precariat echoes exactly the condition of the people that were the proletariat in the sort of 19th century. Mm -hmm. And what yeah. Standing's doing is he's kind of historicizing this concept. And he's kind of saying, oh, the working class is like the stodgy kind of like people who are just trying to defend their jobs and privileges, like, without kind of thinking about the working class as this kind mm -hmm. of like within that kind of more classic Marxist framework, in which case the precariat is the proletariat and the, you know, industrial reserve army of labor, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Yeah. So can, can, we say, can, can we say that you actually expand the idea of proletariat when you are looking that, at your... Proletariat, what I understood from your definition or from your explanation is that you expand 
the, 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 the realm that proletariat occupies, and you included some others uh, in order to make this analysis. Am I right? Did I get it right? As in we, we included uh, different classes of workers or we included people who weren't in work. I mean, there, there's two ways we, we expanded the analysis, I suppose, of what a redistributive movement is. Um, but we do, I mean, you know, and I guess it's where the Weberian stuff comes in a bit too. We would include, and we did include, white-collar and professional unions and workers from those parts. So basically we are doing a very broad, didn't own the means of production, does, you know, um, so therefore they are a member of the workers, very yeah. broadly. So it's a very broad category, um, and, and maybe one of the drawbacks as to why class um, was excluded, but discussing the fact that we still have, you know, a group of people who own the means of production and a group of people who have very little access to any means of production is, is crucial to us, I guess, um, yeah. in the work. And how do we bring it back in? I mean, I guess that's our challenge to everybody is saying, um, just because it somehow became unfashionable, and, and in part, you know, in social movement studies, it became unfashionable to talk about class and capital because everybody focused on the new social movements and said they weren't interested in class and capital, um, means that we kind of stopped talking about the old movements, the trade unions and the labour movements. But that, you know, that for us is a really problematic distinction because for a start, much of the claims making made by the identity movements are, are claims made against um, capitalism, the redistributive claims. So that division becomes problematic. Um, so it takes out of mind the importance, particularly of capitalism, but also the state, in re addressing some of those redistributive issues that we face as workers, but more broadly as people. So, yeah, I don't know. We just thought raising the discussion was a start, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, being brave enough to, to, join, to join those who are anachronistic enough to talk about state, class and capital and say more of us have to be doing it, more of us have to be thinking in those categories. Um, I think it's fascinating to look at identity politics and why individuals join movements and do their very individualised analysis. I'm always fascinated when I, have school, uh, when I have movement activists talk to my classes to ask them, well, what politicised you? But my concern is what are the broader political and economic conditions that inhibit activism in New Zealand and conditions to do with democracy but are set within the political economy. Um, you know, we just have to bring that analysis back in or we're missing too much for the movements themselves. The trade union movement's got to start being really brave with this, I guess, and saying, you know, part of the problem we face is capitalism. Um, you know... It's, it, it's not simple, though. It's not simple because it's unpopular. <laughs> it turns people off. But it's one of our jobs. I mean, certainly the trade union movement accepted the role of informing workers in the 1960s and 70s. Wow. Amazing articles written by trade union movements, eh? Very analytical, very thought-provoking, aimed at workers, yeah, getting like, them engaged. Like workers were treated as intelligent beings. Mm. <laughs> Whereas now they're treated as people that just want light entertainment in those later publications we looked at. Mm. Reality TV. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that helped with the... It's not much of a starting point. It was actually our question to everybody because we prepped that one. So, how do we restart this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether Melanie or... If you had any queries for us or thoughts? Or Max? He's thinking at the moment, I think. <laughs> <laughs> He's striking the classic thinker's pose. Uh. Or Zoe, while, while Max is thinking, Zoe might have something she wants to... No, Chima? No? Sorry, I'll just turn myself, turn back, myself on. back on. Um, no, I'm, I'm uh, tentatively kind of putting my foot in here. I'm actually professional staff in the School of Management, but have done some communications research in the past. So just really interested in it generally. Uh, like you mentioned, the Occupy movement, I followed that with great interest, often from the stance of what's being reported um, versus mm -hmm. what is coming out from, from the people themselves. So just fascinating to listen um, and we'll be really keen to read what you've got. Thank you. Sure. Um, the, the broader project that, that this is part of um, is, um, because I'm not just mad enough to read 149 social movement publications, <laughs> um, is four decades of newspaper coverage of the women's oh. movement, the anti-poverty movement, and the um, workers' movement, the union movement. 
um, which shows also the, the you know kind of the conclusion where it's heading and eventually cross fingers if I get myself organised and write the book on it is to say that the political economy made it unacceptable for those movements um, to engage in conversations about what the state could provide people, the redistribution of goods in society, um, but that journalists certainly didn't help either. So as the nature of journalism shifts oh, yeah. and changes, we go from this very broad discussion of what movements were claiming and what they really wanted and how that fitted with broader changes in society in the 60s and 70s to newspaper reports that only ever reported, and that kind of reflects today, uh, only ever reflected when there was a scuffle between police and protesters, or when somebody did something quirky or stupid as a protester and made it, you know, a good news story as in a good visual, um, which also then disables the New Zealand population from engaging in these broader claims making. Because the claims making next publication only goes to people already engaged in a political act belonging to a union. So how do you get to the broader public? You get there through the mainstream news. And if the mainstream news doesn't talk about capitalism, doesn't talk about class and doesn't talk about the state, or, you know, just talks about individuals who, you know, roughed up the Prime Minister at, you know, near his yacht club, you know, um, that becomes highly problematic. So you might be interested as that work rolls out too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I may have another have... question. Absolutely. We haven't exhausted the questions. <laughs> I, I forgot to introduce myself, by the way. Sorry for that. Um, I'm Ozan, for the ones who haven't met yet. Um, I, I work at School of Management, Massey University. I am interested in... Uh, I'm, I, I'm a kind of organizational scholar interested in social movement organizing, and uh, that's really nice to listen uh, to you, uh, Dylan and Sandra. Um, my question is about New Zealand context. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you referred to there's a kind of global way when we notice uh, such, such patterns of, of changing individualization and, uh, you know, from Keynesian to more neoliberal uh, economics and all these things. Might there be any difference or might there be any kind of contribution from New Zealand context that might challenge this, this, this global wave of neoliberalism? Or is it as same as the global wave. Uh, can can you um, talk about that? We were on the crest of that wave. <laughs> yes, in, in many respects. So of course our welfare state remained intact. Um, uh, still roughly bits of it remain intact, though continually under attack um, for much longer than some nations who moved from the Keynesian model, um, which in part possibly indicates why we get a bit of a lag. So Keynes, you know. Neoliberalism project, if we say it's 1984 and the fourth Labour government, New Zealand doesn't shed the Keynesian welfare state, even though it brings in more market kind of approaches in the financial markets, um, doesn't deregulate its labour market until 1991. So it's that moment, probably, saying that neoliberalism can roll out in those stages, which of course Harvey writes about, but also there are others. Um, you know, peak and tickle um, human geographers who are talking about, you know, the rollout and roll back neoliberal projects yeah. now. But it's yeah. not a singular project. I mean, by and large, I would say New Zealand followed many of the patterns um, that other nations have in the rejection of the Keynesian welfare state. I don't know that we've yet analysed how important that is to movements making claims. That's where I think this probably, you know, the work we've been doing, attempting to say, you know, if you have a Keynesian social welfare state, that state is predicated on people being able to make claims upon the state. It's predicated on the idea that the state will respond to the needs of the population. As the state sheds that project and moves to a more neoliberal or neoconservative project, your right as a citizen to make claims upon the state disappear. You know, and that's, I think, the movement we see in here is is that interaction. So yeah, I mean, it's sad to say that New Zealand on one respect um, follows the patterns of other nations. Um, the broader social movement project, the big thing I found surprising is 1968 in New Zealand, the time and the burgeoning of new social movements of the you know year of the students, the major student protests that occur. There's lots of activism in New Zealand, but it's not a boom time. The boom time comes for us in um, rejecting 
um, the 1990s, the, the late 80s and early 90s, rejecting the further rolling out of the neoliberal project. So there's more activism in the late 80s and 90s than there is in the 1960s and early 70s. That probably is the unique part about New Zealand. That is probably facilitated by the fact that we had a very institutionalised union movement who were in a basically corporatist arrangement with state and employers, was embedded in the power structures, and, um, you know, because of their position, you don't have to take to the streets when you've got a seat at the table. They were able to keep things fairly stable and take claims into the state that way. And I think that, you know, that is different from some of the other neoliberal nations. Um, but, of course, we've since, you know, taken away that place for the trade union movement, and that's possibly why we see a spike are reacting to the taking away of power from the trade union movement. And I'm not claiming that the power held by the trade union movement was exactly good for all New Zealanders because the 1968-1970s, for many people, as our paper shows, meant they were left out of the claims making. Um, so, you know, unions weren't a perfect answer. But that structural relationship certainly is really important in New Zealand social movement trajectories. And you, you, you lose that institutional movement um, small nation, small organising capacity, unions provided the backbone for many other protests. They provided the organising capacity, the financial support, the people, the facilities to organise. Um, you take away that capacity, you take something away from the left overall, and we've certainly achieved that in New Zealand. New, New Zealand trade unions and the publications we read locked down from talking about the world out there, everybody, to talking about survival. And that's understandable in the political economy they worked in. To, you know, it's kind of a hypothermic reaction. They go back to the core. They go back to protecting themselves and their members' working conditions rather than talking about internationalisation and international capital and our part in that project. So I think there's lots to contribute, but it's not a really unique story. But it hasn't been analysed either, you know. Um, we assume the patterns are the same as the US or Europe, and they're not quite the same. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, could I ask a question? Certainly, Max. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I'm Max. I'm currently in Auckland at my own house, um, but studying at uh, University of Auckland. Um, and I was kind of wondering, you talk quite a lot about it being kind of unfashionable um, to talk about class these days and I just kind of wondered if it's it seems to me something slightly deeper than that something slightly you know like we're talking about discourse we're talking about an entire logic that's changed um, and and that it's almost become impossible to speak about class now you just can't talk about it without being purely rubbished out of the room um, so I was kind of wondering if, if, if there's something kind of deeper there and um and I'm kind of interested in the fact uh, that that the fragmentation of society is involved in that, that it's impossible to talk about class now because we're all our own individuals, we're all our own small groups of social movements and things like that. Um, and so I just wonder if you guys are talking about kind of turning back the clock on fragmentation, or how do we how do we start to talk about uh, broad-based social movements again, maybe? Mm -hmm. I guess well, your question is the same question that we finish our paper with, I guess, in many ways, mm -hmm. but that we're sitting at this point, like, yeah, what you're bringing up is very much, you know, what we're kind of interested in reacting to as well and kind of exploring these questions. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it was probably a bit trite to say it's just unfashionable. You're right. Yeah. I mean, for those that, that, that um, don't know, um, I actually have taken leave from Victoria University to work um, full-time back in the Tertiary Education Union as the national... President. So I've been an active trade unionist now for about seven years. I've held the national presidency once before. Um, but both in my own scholarship and in the trade union movement, I do very much get the sense that um, it's not just that it's unfashionable. There just isn't the space to discuss class or capital. That it doesn't even come on our radar when we have meetings. So I recently, I won't say where I went, but I recently went to a meeting where all the conversation of the activists in the room were about technical details to do with a database and none of it about a grand vision of another society that we should live in. 
you know, technical detail about how we identify whether someone might be part of our organisation. And I think that's symptomatic of this broader idea, which is there isn't room to talk about, A, where we want to be, the vision, but B, you know, are we allowed to collectivise to get that vision? Are we actually... Um, and I guess it was reflected in the Labour Party's recent vote for a new leader, when all of the publicity about the union's block vote, you know, the unions banded together and got Andrew Little over the line. Um, just to declare, TEU is not an affiliate of the Labour Party, so, you know, not breaching any problems for our union here. Um, but, you know, yes, unions band together. They know the power of the collective. What is wrong with collectivising to even out the power stakes? But all of a sudden it's evil. It's evil. If you collectivise, you're getting too much power. So there's a whole dynamic there that is much broader than just class isn't a good word to use, find the precarious or some other more fashionable term, thank you. It is a whole discussion around are we individuals, are we members of a society? And we saw it with social movement publications. Lots of stories about individuals, and I like stories about individual members coming through, but the point is, collectively, where are we heading as a union? Where are we heading as a group of workers, as a group of students? How do we bring that back into the conversation? Um, you know, what, how do we get away from the idea that all those peoples that make claims upon the state, all those former trade unionists, all the women's liberation movement people, all the, um, you know, queer movement people, they stood up collectively to make claims upon the state and they got things they wanted. That's not bad. That's actually really good. But I do think it is a broader, um, a broader debate. But again, I'd probably then come back to the political economy, that there is something in the political economy. It suits the elite, both political and economic and social, actually. It suits the elite to have us all believing that we're just as powerful, each of the members of the elite. Therefore, they are very good at selling their narrative and we're not good at selling ours. We're not good at passing our narrative on. They've been immensely successful in saying to workers, you don't need that thing called a union. You can go in and you can renegotiate your terms. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of us have tried that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I would never do it, you know. Um, so I think, you know, the political economy then sets up this collective is bad, individual is good. And again, we have to challenge that narrative. And it is a, it is a war of words. A war of concepts, a war of mm. narratives. And it is using that, that structural framework yeah. To, yeah. as a base, and then I guess trying to, on top of that base, having a kind of vision yeah. of where you're trying to go to collectively, rather than being reactive, which is generally where we find ourselves these days. You're reacting against individual things that are coming up that you don't like, or that you're trying to hold on to, rather than yeah. saying this is where we're trying to head. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, um, Kim Workman is my name. I, I'm, uh, I'm a, stout, a stout fellow here for the next 12 months. So I'm here for a year to, to write a book on, on um, the criminal justice system, the state, and Māori from 1985 to the present day. And Not a small topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've got to keep myself active <laughs> over the next year. Uh, but... Yeah, I, and I'm really thankful that I came because one of the things that has been testing my, my um, me somewhat is that um, if I read historically um, what was happening in the 1960s and 70s, it, a lot of it is defined in terms of class, you know, and then trying to express that in today's language. Um, and um, trying to find some way of of articulating that um, in a different way, and um, you know, there's been growing a lot of work done, in the, in particularly in the states about uh, racism and mm. using a racist analysis around mm. what has happened in the prisons, mm. which would be a very comfortable fit for for New Zealand, I guess, um, but. Um, also, you know, I was really interested in your comments about, you know, the 1980s, and uh, obviously I chose 1985 because mm. it was an important mm. point yes. in our history. Mm. Um, but it wasn't, a, um, you know, a very simple period of time because mm. 
on the one hand you had the the market state emerging mm. on the other you had mm. radical youth justice reforms mm. going on, you had bicultural mm. imperative happening, mm. Maori development happening, positive stuff, mm. and, and, but on the other hand um, mm. um, you had this growing uh, punitiveness mm. you know, emerging as a result of the mm. focus on individualism and an intolerance of mm. those who were not up to the mark. Mm. Um, and and um, well, one of the things that did occur to me uh, was that perhaps some of this collectivism and some of this, uh, you know, common uh, uh, sort of expression uh, that we're looking for uh, might come from some rather unexpected places. You know, I, I just uh, note that there's a, a public good website now that's developed talking about, you know, um, and, and, you know, websites that are focusing on what it means to be a democracy. Um, so there's a, and one of the interesting things to me is that uh, one of our uh, stalwart critics in recent times have been the um, various committees of the United Nations. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, whether it's arbitrary detention or the elimination of racial discrimination, they are uh, driving home, I think, quite well uh, a lot of the stuff that we're hiding mm. and don't want to discuss. Mm. Uh, and I think um, one, one of the... Um, sooner or later, I think, you know, uh, it may come to a point where people will be f forced uh, to address some of those, yeah. those larger Absolutely. issues. But um, I'm not a, a sociologist, so... Yeah, no, neither am I, by the way. I'm a political scientist. But I was right. actually going to comment on... I mean, it is interesting as I look at the trends of the state over the last four decades, mm -hmm. you know, through the 80s um, to now. And I guess one of the things I say, and I think, you know, this perhaps maps some of the things we've been doing, is that the state in and of itself was much more divided and contested space through the 80s than we like to acknowledge. Right. So, it, you know, the, the government, while imposing market models in some yeah. places, is hugely social liberal in others. Yes. Um, a much more divided state, a much more... Um, I, I don't like the word pluralistic state because I have problems with the concept of pluralism, but most scholars in my field would analyse a pluralistic state where there were lots of groups making claims on the state, including from within. Mm -hmm. So public servants, you know, huge movements around um, restorative justice coming not just from the outside, but from within the state. I would say now we have such a tight elitist state, an elitist democracy that is so tight now. There isn't challenge from within the state because there is no challenge allowed, certainly mm. Ministry of mm. Justice, Ministry of Corrections, MSB, our own Ministry of, you know, the Minister of Tertiary Education, they don't allow challenge from within, mm. and any challenge from without is dismissed, mm. particularly collective challenge from without. So I think we had a fundamental shift in the type of democracy and state we are in that period, and while... I would never say, um, you know, and, and you know, as a, as a private citizen would say, you know, I don't agree with many of the changes made through the 80s. It's very uneven because the state opened itself to challenge, because the state wasn't locked down in the way it is now. I would say, you know, we have a state now that is a highly punitive in every aspect, not just criminal justice, to do with poor people, to do with workers. Um, is is highly individualistic in the way that it treats people, um, almost almost feudal. You know, if you have the right idea, you have a sensible sentencing trust with the right idea that suits the political need of the elite, they will run with your idea. But if you threaten their stability as an elite, you will get no play. So you know, there is it's a really interesting forty years to look at the state, and it has not been properly analysed. You know, the, um, the last kind of big texts that are out on the state from political scientists still analyse the state and government as being pluralistic. Show me where now we have a state open to challenge, mm. open to many voices, open to the collective voice. I, don't, I mean, I see it nowhere. And nowhere in, uh, with this current government, but 
but I actually don't see it with the previous Labor governments either no. of the of the early 2000s, you know, the, of the late 90s. Sorry, there's no there's no indication to me that we had a pluralistic state under Labor either. So I think there is, you know, and I guess that's the other thing. You know, if we can bring the state back in and make it central to our analysis, we can start saying, why don't we have more success as citizens in changing the world we live in? Because we have a state unwilling to back the, the population. They were willing to back. They had to back because they relied on us for their power. Now they, I don't know where they get their power from. They think they get it from the three yearly election. They get it from somewhere. Yeah. I guess it's helped define uh, an underclass at the same time. Because, oh, absolutely. You know, we've got this group out there that um, everybody is crapping on. Really. Absolutely. And, and, and it absolutely is a class. This is a yeah. class war. Yeah. They've turned most of us against the poor, yeah. those who are imprisoned, who happen to often be the poorest. <laughs> you know, it's no coincidence. Um, and they work really hard with their narratives to make the rest of us see that as the undesirable yeah. class. Um, and to make the rest of us believe that we have the good life and they're the cause of our... Any troubles we have are, the, are caused by that underclass. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, interesting in this context how, you know, with the um, political economy and this kind of wider kind of, like, mm. context falling away that you mentioned things like websites coming up talking about public good. There's a sort of, like, for the people who are trying to um, mobilise these days, it often seems that you need to do it on a moral ground. That's yeah. why we have focus on child poverty now, because yeah. that's yeah. completely yeah. unacceptable, but you don't have that embedded within this wider kind of structural analysis of capitalism or da-da-da. Yeah. Yeah. Or even an adult poverty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it sort of moves to this moral ground, which is quite interesting. We, Would you say there's that nowhere that, else to go, is it? Mm, <laughs> the only way to then sort of get action against the state is to appeal to the middle, like the middle classes, the aspirational classes, who may then get put off by this talk of class if they... I think you just need to bypass them all together, politically. <laughs> just forget about them. But then they're the a, ones third of the, a third of the population don't even vote. True, but they're the ones that the National Party care about because they're their votes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's true. I mean, it is interesting how you would strategize bringing this back in more broadly to public conversation. I mean, maybe class is a, a label, I mean, as an analytical category, we're saying is useful. Mm. Maybe it isn't useful for unions to reuse it, but they have to find a word that equates to and that pull, draws on the theorising and the conceptual framework. Um, you know, cause, and I guess they are to an extent. We were talking about things that indicate classes back on the agenda. Um, the living wage campaign, to some extent, would be for me a union project like that, and the supersize my pay campaigns being run um, through Unite. There are some campaigns being run by unions which I say indicate they know class has to be back in the picture, mm. that we have to analyse the situation of the working classes. But it's about a little project so far. I think there is a movement building mm. kind of thing happening at this point. Mm. In many ways, I kind of, with my thesis, I kind of have the sense maybe that now is our 1848 moment, following 2011 being this kind of year of revolution that didn't really get anywhere, we're kind of looking around at each other, seeing there's lots of people who are willing to mobilise, but the organisational kind of capacity isn't there yet. And we're sort of back at 1848, having to build this wider kind of set of movement um, organisations, as well as a vision of where we're trying to go to collectively. Kind of mm, interesting times, I think. Which is probably a good place for us to end, isn't it? <laughs> the big challenge. It's not small people. You know, God, there's a movement in this room and in the, in the associated technological space. The <laughs> revolution starts here. Ooh. Absolutely. So again, thank you for joining us. Mm. It's been a great conversation. I would like to thank you a lot. Uh, it was our first seminar for 2015, and it's a great beginning, and it's a great discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Dylan and Sandra, on behalf of our network.